246 I was not able to do right uh, so there was a little bit of uh, misconception when I was trying to solve it uh, I thought that this O uh, so the vertex of this uh, A cone that is fixed right so it's a uh, it's like I don't know so, some kind of joint it's just fixed there and then yeah I thought that's happening in reality that was not the case it's uh, it's free to move and then it just uh, yeah so you don't even need the torque equations anymore uh, or you know any uh, energy conservation momentum conservation you don't need that all you need is just the uh, the motion of the center of mass will be sufficient right so what is happening is that the center of mass it is actually like going around um, what do we call it it's going around a circle yes and uh, the total force on on this uh, cone A, it's just the friction force uh, plus the normal force plus the gravity force, I get it. Uh, and then once you do that, you will get, I mean, you need to find the components and everything. You will get what the centimeter acceleration is, right? Now, there's another important thing that the center of mass, it's not speeding up. So it's uh, its angular acceleration is not speeding up about, about the point O. And what that means is that there is no tangential acceleration uh, for this cone. That is, the friction force has no component, to, so uh, though uh, no tangential component, even though it does have uh, the x and y components. Okay, so now we are ready to do it. Right. So yeah, I mean, like this was much easier than what I thought it would be. Like uh, we can find a very loose inequality that will uh, tell us what at what condition uh, the friction is not sufficient anymore right we can find that out uh, we can also figure out what the static friction is uh, if given the omega right we should be able to do it okay cool so now let's do the force analysis of this guy so so like basically it's just um well i mean you got this cone right uh it's having angle alpha is the half angle uh, this whole surface that's what's creating the normal force on this cone so the normal force is perpendicular to the surface and then you got some friction there's no tangential component there can only be uh, I mean and of course there can only be components that are uh, tangential to this uh, surface as well and uh, the first tangential refers to uh, the whole cone A so uh, in this kind of direction so yeah coming out towards us and the other Tangentially, that I'm talking about is like this. So throughout this plane, right? So there's only one direction that this force can go. Uh, the friction force. It is going to go like that. So you got some normal force over here. You got some friction force. Yeah, I use small f for acceleration sometimes. Sometimes friction force doesn't really matter. Okay, cool. Uh, yes, uh, the total acceleration for this guy's center of mass. That's just a centripetal acceleration because yeah. And then you got gravity on this. So this uh, guy, it just has its center of mass somewhere. We don't even know, need to know where, where that is because, yeah. Right, so it's gonna be omega squared r and everything. Or maybe we should know where it is or something. For, for the second condition, I mean, you just need to figure out the critical condition. So uh, it's not that hard, I guess. Yeah. So we just call this whole thing as r. And then, you know, there's a, certain centrifugal force on this thing yes so omega squared r but m times of that and then you got mg like that and then in that reference frame where uh, you got the centrifugal force uh, these forces should balance yes does that make sense so now uh, you got this alpha angle over here this should be 90 minus alpha because of course perpendicular. oh it should be 90 minus 2 alpha so uh, this complete thing is just 90 minus alpha right Let's do it 90 minus 2 alpha and then this thing is just going to be 2 alpha i guess because it's perpendicular to that oh no it's, uh, this thing is 90 degree and then you got this so that's 90 minus 2 alpha this thing is alpha so this completely is 90 minus alpha so this should be alpha so that this will be 90 plus alpha that makes sense so you just got f cosine alpha uh is equal to m omega squared r plus n Cosine of this complete thing just 90 minus alpha, so um, sine alpha. It's supposed to be 90 degrees, not 90, not radian, all right? Okay, and then you got the vertical balance is just going to be F sine alpha plus 
and uh, sine of this quantity. So not 90 minus alpha is supposed to be cosine alpha. Uh, that will just be equal to mg. So I guess we do need to figure out what r is going to be. So um, yeah, that's complicated. You do need to know what r is, huh? But they didn't give us anything about the density or whatever, right? So uh, they just told us like, it's around cone, mass is given, half angle is given, uniformly, okay, whatever. Um, the center of gravity uh, of the cone A is at the same level as the point O and at O. So they already gave us what R value we, we need to use. So yeah, I mean, if they didn't give us what this R value is, it would be really hard for us to figure out anything because you would have to calculate this guy's center of mass and then we don't, don't, we don't know if it's a hollow cone or a full cone or whatever, or if it's uniform or not right but good thing they already told us where the center of mass is so it's a uh, distance l is equal to 17 centimeter from the point o so instead of r i will just use l that's what they are using right yes so then yeah this should just be m omega squared l right so you got our two equations you can figure out what this should be uh you can also figure out what this is we don't know what this is what or what this is and uh we don't do not even need the normal really we just want the friction force so why not we just uh, you know cancel these normals away yeah so that should do it uh and also for the second case you would need a normal force because we need to set up that inequality so i guess we just have to solve this linear equation right so this equation is just like f cosine alpha minus n you know what let's not do it let's not do it like that we, instead what we will do is that we'll take the components of uh uh, of the centrifugal force and the gravity uh, with these two lines, right? So this is going to be what? Like this guy, um, this whole thing is 90, this thing is 90 minus alpha, so this should be alpha, I mean, that's obvious, this was the half angle, so it must be like that. Right, that's alpha, so you can figure out what components of this guy is there. And then this thing is, uh, gravity is like downward, so uh, this is going to be, this is horizontal, right? So it's 90 minus alpha right there, that's mg. Okay, so let's do it. This will be like m omega squared r and then you got cosine of that so cosine of alpha and then you got so all the horizontal forces then you got mg cosine of 90 plus alpha is just mg sine alpha so you got mg sine alpha is equal to the force uh, the friction force yes and then you got well yeah that should make sense and then you got this uh balance so normal plus m omega squared this component is like 90 plus alpha so uh Cosine of that, it's gonna be sine of alpha. So m omega squared r, it should be l actually. Sine alpha is equal to, so this is the gravity that is opposing this. So you got mg um, sine of this one, it's just gonna be mg cosine alpha. There we go. Cool, so now you got friction force and normal force directly, right, without solving anything. And this was almost as if you, as if you uh, put, uh, rotation matrix on the system of equations but hey let's not do all that so friction force is m times omega squared l times cosine alpha plus g sine alpha and the normal force is m times g cosine alpha minus omega squared l sine alpha so first of all a uh, you want to figure out the static friction force acting on cone A at omega given. Fine, I mean, you already know alpha, you know what omega is, you know what you, you can figure out everything. Okay, cool. Oh, oh, sorry. So, 146, now you got the equations, huh? Let's just put these over here. Okay, so let's calculate what the friction force is for this particular case. So, what's the mass? The mass is 3.2. Then you got omega squared L, uh, omega is 1, okay, it's just 1, and then you got L, 70 centimeters, like 0 0.17 meters. Cosine of alpha, alpha is, what? Are you serious? Why is that 10 degrees? I don't know what cosine of 10 degrees is. Nobody would know. I'm just going to leave it like that because, uh, honestly, no one can actually calculate when you have cosine 10 degrees. Yeah, it's just not doable. So we'll just leave it. I mean, I could use a small angle approximation or something like that, but nah, I'm just gonna leave it like that. And then they want at what value of omega the uh, cone A will roll. 
without sliding, if the coefficient of friction between the surface is equal to k is equal to zero, fine. So you want the critical condition, but of course, force is equal to mu times n, k times n, fine. So uh, the ratio of these two, right? That's just um, yeah, that's just less than or equal to uh, k because yes, 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 that should that should be working. So this upon that is less than or equal to k. So basically, like this is less than or equal to k times of that, fine. It's so got omega squared L cosine alpha plus G sine alpha is less than or equal to uh, KG cosine alpha minus omega squared L sine alpha times K. So now we need to figure out the omega. So omega squared L, then you got cosine alpha. And this should be positive, I guess. Yeah, I mean, this is positive, so that should also be positive by default. So cosine alpha, then you got plus sine alpha k is less than or equal to g times of uh, k cosine alpha minus sine alpha and then you just gotta put this so omega squared l is less than or equal to g times of so what i'm going to do is divide by cosine alpha right away so this will be like k minus tan alpha uh, upon one plus well oh yeah it's so like it's just k tan alpha huh? so this is like uh, tan of Fine, fine, fine. So it's uh, it's very much doable. So it's gonna be less than or equal to g tan of uh well tan inverse of k, which actually holds a lot of importance because yeah whatever. I mean it's the critical angle if you if the friction feature was on a plane or something. But now in this case, in this situation it makes no sense. Why would you want to define it as a new quantity? But whatever, you could define it as a new quantity. And then minus of uh, tan alpha. Oh, sorry, minus of alpha, not tan alpha. Right, so this should be doing it. Okay, cool. So now you know what omega should be less than. And yeah, it's perfect. We can delete this thing. So it really is like omega critical. So I'm going to call this omega C is equal to. Okay, this thing upon L, I guess, and square root of that. So square root of G upon L tan of tan inverse K minus alpha right yeah so 146 done let's go to 147 now in the reference frame uh, k dash two particles travel along the x-axis one of mass m1 with a velocity v1 and other of mass m2 with velocity v2 find the velocity of so reference frame k is this k or k dash i don't know they're gonna give us a figure okay uh, fine, so this reference frame k, I think it's not k dash right there. Okay, so two particles travel along the x-axis, one of mass m1, velocity v1, along the x-axis, right? m1, v1, they don't, we don't know their positions yet. Uh, other of mass m2 is velocity v2, so, yeah, so look at that. What do you want to find? Find the velocity v of the reference frame k dash in which the cumulative kinetic energy of these particles is minimum. Ah, right. Okay, okay, okay. So, yeah. What you want is like half m1 times v1 minus uh, whatever velocity uh, the reference frame k dash has. That guy squared. And then let's just say the, uh, the velocity is completely in x direction because why go for the y direction? It would just increase the velocity by adding up another component over there. Right? So, going in other directions is just uh, not good. Don't do that. It will just increase the uh, energy. You got half of m1, okay, all that stuff. And you got plus half m2, v2 minus v squared, whatever. You want to find when is this going to be uh, the, um, yeah, minimum, right? So, of course, the velocity cannot be, uh, uh, it can't be negative, that would make no sense, right? Wait, what if v1 and v2 are uh, not of the same sign? Then that's kind of problematic, right? Ooh, that is... Okay, fine. So this will be like a quadratic. Anyway, when you just expand this, you'll get some... So take that half out, it's gonna be m1 times uh, v1 squared, and you got m2 times v2 squared as the constant term. Then you got minus 2 times of m1 v1 plus m2 v2 times uh, v so it's the linear term and then you got plus the square terms so m1 plus m2 times v squared 
So of course this will be the minimum when uh, just have like negative b upon 2a. So negative of this quantity upon 2 times of this quantity. So it's basically going to be m1 uh, v1 plus m2 v2 upon m1 plus m2, right? That's what we should be so that this becomes minimum. And of course it's just a, an upward parabola so it works out. So there we go. Right, so 147a done. Let's put this quantity in there. So, oh wait, isn't this just like the center of mass? Oh yeah. So, of course. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, this is making a bit of sense now. She's got the center of mass. Uh huh. And then whenever you move uh, away from the center of mass, your energy increases. Well, this is very similar to what happens in uh, rotation. Yes, but this is not exactly a rotation. It's something different, I guess. Oh, yeah, I mean, uh, maybe the same uh, derivation that we did for rotation, same thing follows over here as well. Let's try it out. Let's see if that actually is the case. So, yeah. I mean, it's not a rigid body, actually. Uh, the main problem is that it's not a rigid body. So some of the things might not work out just as we expect them to. But still, so you've got half of m1 square v1. Just uh, skip that half, really. So you've got mi vi square. What we'll do is just say vi is equal to uh, this fancy v times i. Sorry, fancy v sub i, not times i. Uh, which is just a relative velocity as seen by the center of mass. Then plus v0. Uh, yes, putting that in there, so uh, vectors of course. Right? So the square of this thing will just be this fancy thing squared plus you got two uh, v naught vector dot fancy v vector plus v naught squared and then of course it makes sense we just do summation of this thing but scaling up by m and then yeah like this term uh, when some just becomes the kinetic energy uh, as seen by the uh, center of mass this thing just becomes the kinetic energy of the center of mass right and then finally you have this term which will become zero because you can take that to be not out and then the uh this terms like summation of this term are uh, multiplied by m1 of course like that thing just becomes zero right so wow this is actually not limited to rigid bodies it could work for like anything actually perfect so 147 is awesome huh i could use this more more often you know okay anyway b the commutative kinetic energy of the particles in the k dash frame. So, uh, huh, huh. now we can do the same thing. The the formula that we built. Yeah. So call this thing as uh, v not really. Uh, so using that formula, uh, it was just, or maybe let's not do it. Uh, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm -hmm. yeah. Well. Okay, think about it. Wait, wait, wait. The last, I mean, the, the last few lines we wrote uh, were the, I mean, not the energy as seen by the center of mass. I, I get all that. Oof. Uh, but the center of mass itself is it's moving, right? Okay, so this first term that we actually got, so half, uh, and then you got the kinetic energy as seen by the center of mass. I'll just call this as uh k naught okay and plus some other term right so uh, i mean when we will do the derivation for a uh below it right uh what we got was don't want it half right there so the kinetic energy was written like this so kinetic energy as seen by the center of mass and then the kinetic energy of the center of mass right or uh the way i usually do this is i will say kinetic energy of the center of mass is o and kinetic energy as seen by the center of mass is one uh, k one right so this k one thing actually is constant because the center of mass of the particle will be constant in any frame right i mean that relative velocity stuff all of that stuff right that will remain a constant in any frame you take and then k naught depends on the frame doesn't that make sense so for this particular frame, since uh, the center of mass uh, is in fact the reference point, then that means K0 will be zero because it's not moving as seen by itself. So it, it, this is just zero. So like K1 is the way to go, which is, I mean, okay, that makes sense because that's exactly what we calculated. So it's still just as messy as it 
would be uh, fine let's do it fine so just figure out what b minus v naught should be or something like that uh, or you could use this thing directly so like it was what half times of m1 v1 squared plus m2 v2 so this was like the constant stuff and then you got minus two times of m1 v1 plus m2 v2 and then you got v and then plus m1 plus m2 times v squared and then the way to figure out this energy would be to uh, do the minus t upon 4a thing right yes so minus t will already contain that four factors that we cancel just got half times off so this thing squared minus this times that right oh that's going to be really really long fine let's do it m1 squared v1 squared plus m2 squared v2 squared plus 2 m1 m2 v2 right that's so the m1 m2 v1 v2 uh, just write down the expansion right here so you got m1 squared v1 squared plus m2 squared v2 squared right that thing then minus uh oh uh, sorry plus 2 m1 m2 v1 v2 and then minus this times that so that would also contain m1 squared v1 squared and m2 squared v2 squared but it will also contain the cross terms that is m1 m2 times uh, v2 squared and then plus m2 m1 uh, v1 squared so basically m1 m2 v1 squared right yes so uh, subtraction and that's why well this all of this just cancels out and in the end we want to put a negative in the front so actually it should be like this so wow this just becomes so c m1 m2 is common it's got v2 square minus 2 v1 v2 plus v1 square it's got to be two times of so, uh what am i doing m1 m2 times v2 minus v1 squared right that's the negative d part and so negative d upon four part and then that, that thing upon a so that will just be m1 plus m2 makes sense so b is this thing oh half of that actually because half mp is one of that stuff so cool okay so that's the thing next so let's go to 148 a reference frame in which the center of inertia of a given system of particles is at rest translates with the velocity v related to the to an inertial reference frame k okay so basically the center of mass translates with velocity v given to the origin yeah that makes sense uh origin of this reference frame k the mass of the system of particles equals uh, m and the total energy of the system in the frame of the center of inertia is equal to e oh yeah of course so you just found out the first constant term and then the other term is just like ah it was easy find out total energy e of the system uh, of particles in the reference frame k uh, this is just really easy so <laughs> yeah it's gonna be e plus uh plus half mv squared where v is the velocity of the center of mass so that is uh they even gave us that thing so like it's got half mv squared wow easy as that 149 good thing we made that formula right away two small disks of mass m1 and m2 interconnected by a weightless spring rests on a smooth horizontal plane okay let's draw it out uh, so they give the gave any figures no fine so let's do it on the next page yes. uh two spring two two small discs of masses m1 m2 interconnected by a weightless spring hmm. horizontal uh, horizontal plane cool smooth horizontal plane so just got something like this this is a yeah and they want discs right so like this so got m1 m2 discs and uh on a horizontal surface and smooth horizontal surface uh, spring in between the discs are set in motion with initial velocities v1 v2 whose directions are mutually perpendicular and lie in the horizontal plane wait what find the total energy e of the system in the ref in the frame of the uh, center of inertia uh 
I mean, okay, this X, so the, so the extension of this spring is the same in any frame. So yeah, well that works out. And then there's just the kinetic energy, right? Uh, and these are given well, velocities V1 and V2, whose directions are mutually perpendicular and lie in the horizontal plane. Ah, what do they mean mutually perpendicular? How would it be? And both lie in the horizontal, okay, maybe like this and that. Oh, okay, okay, I understand what's happening. So the thing is the center of mass will then just have the velocity as M1, V1 plus, so M1, V1 vector, of course, and then yeah, you got m2 v2 vector and then upon m1 plus m2 but the thing is like these two vectors m1 v1 and m2 v2 but <laughs> uh yeah well those are perpendicular so just use the but uh by the way theorem and get this done so you've got square root of that of course this is the velocity what we really need is the square of this thing anyway so just got m1 plus m2 squared and the square of this thing will just be m1 squared v1 squared plus m2 squared v2 squared right by the theorem Right, because m1 m1 dot m2 will be zero, so that's our v squared for the uh, center of mass. Yeah, so it's like v naught squared, and then m1 plus m2. Look at that, just the total mass, right? So m m v naught squared, so it should be squared, okay, is just m1 uh, v1 squared plus m2 uh, v2 squared. Well, that is very weird. So you are saying the kinetic energy of the center of mass is the same thing as the kinetic energy is. Uh, of these bodies themselves uh, but like no that, that can't be I mean hmm. this didn't go so well but like you know that uh, there should be an extra term so uh, this is total kinetic energy so total kinetic energy uh, is equal to I mean half of that is total kinetic energy but you get that right this our equation was just that this should be equal to or you know write it in the proper uh, terminology so k is the total kinetic energy that's supposed to be equal to k naught which is the kinetic energy of the center of mass and k1 which is the kinetic energy uh, as seen by the center of mass right well this thing is k and uh, this is k naught but since these are equal what that means is k1 is zero uh huh that makes no sense how would that be uh no it oh it's there's there's a square sorry ah it's a different equation altogether oops <laughs> yeah this is how it should be uh huh huh makes sense but yeah well what that means is you can figure out what uh mv naught square should be so once you have this thing right and the, you can just figure out what k is this is a these are not correct relations but yeah, you can figure out what K1 is, and that's what we need to figure out. We want to figure out the, so and it's better, no, what question is this? 149, right? We want to figure out uh, total energy E of the system in the frame of the center of inertia. Exactly. So we just need to do uh, K minus K0, and K is very easy to figure out. It's just half M1 V1 squared plus half M2 V2 squared. And now we also know what K1 is. So this will just be half m v naught squared, which is uh, this thing about m basically. So you got m one squared v one squared plus m two squared v two squared upon m one plus m two. Right. This thing is going to be k one. So now you got the kinetic energy part done. You just need the potential energy as well. Uh, so plus half k x squared. Right. So now this k x squared thing it varies with time, I guess. Oh, okay. We just want the total. Right. What am I doing? Sorry. 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 Uh huh. -huh. Yeah, you just want. So the the thing is, energy conservation works in all kinds of frames, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Because I mean, even if you take the center of mass as the frame, um, that will still work, I guess. So this is just the initial energy. So uh, this whole thing is just the initial kinetic energy when the extension was zero. But then, because of energy conservation, this will be the total kinetic energy anyway. Makes sense, right? Yes. So now I can just put that as an answer. So forget about the string. Because initial is... Oh, sorry. I deleted some of... Uh, sorry, okay. okay, so this is our uh, equation in the end. 
वही तो मेरे पास राइट कूल वन फिफ्टी so yes kinetic energy is dependent on the system but how it behaves is not so much dependent unless there are for pseudo forces which probably there are pseudo forces right yes i mean this center of mass will be no you know what no there won't be because uh, the center of mass will be moving with uh, no it actually yeah it's it's going to move with a uh, a uh, fixed velocity that's right It's the it's the inertial frame of reference, so then uh, kinetic energy conservation will be perfect. It will just yeah work the best. Thing is, they gave us v one, v two uh, as the velocities of the blocks. They this whatever. And that means the velocity of the uh, so the total velocity of the system is fixed in stone. <laughs> yeah, the the spring has no mass, so it cannot change. <laughs> And yeah, uh, I mean even even if it did change. Then we also count in kinetic energy that is. So yeah, the thing is, the velocity of the center of path is fixed, so it's an inertial frame. Perfect. One forty nine done. One fifty. A system consists of two small spheres of masses m one and m two interconnected by a weightless spring. Uh, where is it? The figure? There's no figure. Okay. Two small spheres of m one and m two connected by a weightless spring. Okay. Uh, at the moment equal to zero, the 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 spheres are set in motion with the initial velocity is given v two. After which the system starts moving in the Earth's uniform gravitational field. What? Okay. Neglecting the air drag, find the time dependence of the total momentum of this. Come on. Okay. Are you serious? Uh, in the process of motion and the radius vector of its. Oh, okay. This is a uh, different. Radius vector of its center of. Okay. You know what? No, no, no. It's not that different. It it's doable. Center of inertia related to the initial position. So the thing is, like the forces put on by the spring, those are equal opposite, and that's why they produce no change in momentum. Or, you know, yeah, its momentum is constant. What is the momentum? Oh, this is going to be m1 v1 plus m2 v2, right? Uh, well, these are of course uh, velocity vectors. Uh, what velocities did they give us? Initial velocity is v1 v2, but in what direction? Hmm. We we'll just say these are, I don't know, vectors. Fine. Okay, so they were they just gave us some kind of velocities. Fine. This is the total momentum. What they want to figure out is the momentum uh, when it will go to the Earth. Right. So uh, what after that? Okay. So this is done. Right. They give us the velocities, and after which the system starts moving the Earth's uniform. So from t equal to zero itself, it starts moving in uh, Earth's field. In fact, yes. So you can just do minus g vector. It should be plus because vectors, right? Yes. So plus m1 plus m2 times g vector times time. That's right. That's our momentum. So it was very easy. Your momentum, which I like to call as p. Okay, it's equal to this thing. We don't need this diagram. And then, of course, the what else do they want? The uh, radius vector of its center of inertia related to initial. Come on, come on, it's very simple. So this point of mass will give us the velocity vector. So velocity will just be m1 v1 vector plus m2 v2 vector upon m1 plus m2, and then you got this plus. Ah, uh, it's just a, uh, I mean, constant acceleration case. You can just use those equations of motion. In fact, in constant acceleration, and then you got this thing, and then plus half a t square whatever. So this is upon m1 m2. M1 plus M2 anyway, so that cancels. You got half g vector t square. That is the radius vector. Cool. So this was doable, and this is just r mod vector. Yes, and then you got 151. Two bars of masses M1 M2 connected by a weightless spring of stiffness uh, x. Figure 1.39. Okay, rest on smooth horizontal plane. Part two is shifted. A small distance x to the left, and then released. 
find the velocity of the center of inertia of the system after bar one breaks off the wall. Ah, uh, right, right, right. So it's uh, it's compressed first of all by what? This is x, and uh, I'll just take stiffness a, uh, stiffness k. Yes, uh, not whatever this symbol is, but yeah. So it's first compressed, then uh, for some time. So for half the period, in fact. What will happen is that there's only uh, the, the normal force is in fact balancing the spring force on A, so it's not moving. But after that, so after it has once again reaches its equilibrium position, it will start moving like that. So now there's uh, there's pulling force on one, so normal force can't uh, do anything, and one will move. That's what's gonna happen. What they want is velocity of the center of inertia of the system after one breaks off the wall. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So it's not uh, put with the velocity like that. No, no, no. It's it's first compressed, and you just have to wait till it reaches the equilibrium, right? It's not that hard. I mean, the change in energy is just half. I mean, change in energy of this of this spring is just half k x squared. That's equal to the change in the kinetic energy of the system. So it's gonna be half m v squared. So m two v squared, uh, v two squared, or yeah, whatever. Right. So from this, you can figure out what v two is, and of course, v one is just zero because it. Doesn't have any acceleration on it. Yeah, and then once uh, normal force becomes zero, it will start to accelerate. Not that it will, uh, not that it will just gain some kind of momentum. No, that won't happen. It's not impulsive. It will slowly start to accelerate, and then yeah, go with some velocity uh, in the end. Yes, what we want is velocity of the center of inertia. Cool. We got what we. In fact, just call it V. Or no, it's called V two. So yeah, just got v2 is equal to square root of kx squared upon m2. So m2 v2, which will just be a uh, square root of m2 kx squared at plus well zero because m1 has no velocity, and then this upon m1 plus m2. This is the velocity of the center of inertia. Cool, done. No big deal. Let's go to 152. Two bars connected by weightless spring of stiffness x and stiffness k. I'll just use k and length in the non-deform state L not rests on a horizontal plane. So figure 1.4. Okay, this thing. A constant horizontal force f starts acting on the on one of the uh, bars as shown. Find the maximum and minimum distances between the bars during subsequent motion of the system. Okay, if the masses of the bars uh, of the bars are equal. And equal to so basically general case if these are any m one m two masses. Okay, cool. So you got a constant force over here, and um, hmm. This guy's center of mass is accelerating at a constant rate. Yes, I can understand that. Uh, that's not what I'm do. What I do? Okay, that that's not nice. Come on, think about it. You just want to figure out the maximum. You know what? Yeah, scrap it. I'll just write down equations of motion because that way I can say everything for sure. So you've got uh, whatever x. I mean, your, whatever your elongation will be. I'll just call elongation as x. Oh, we could take. I mean, we could take uh, m2 as our reference frame, but then you're gonna have to deal with pseudo forces and whatnot. Which I mean, okay, it's not that bad really. Uh, just, just think about it. So you got this, these two blocks, M1, M2. You got um, the kx force like that. Here you got this kx force. Okay, 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 okay. okay. And then you got uh, this force right there. So like F minus kx upon M2. This guy will be the acceleration of this M2 block, and then kx upon M1 will be the acceleration of the M1 block, uh, both in the same direction, the right direction. Now the subtraction of these two will be so like this will start increasing, and this will actually start. So if if this uh, product is positive, then what will happen is that this is actually just accelerating faster, right? So. Yeah, we just want our elongation to increase. Uh, then this would just be 
right? So this whole acceleration difference that will just be equal to uh, d squared x upon dt squared, right? Yes. Uh, what if this was negative? Then it's uh, it's like this thing is uh, accelerating faster. So in fact, your x would be you would, ha would have a tendency to decrease. Not that it's decreasing right away, but it will have a tendency to do it in the future. So what that means is, yeah, it will it will it, it will be like it's negative, but then d squared x upon dt squared is also negative because it's uh yeah yeah right of course it's increasing the tendency for x to decrease so it should be negative yes so then this equation is good it works for both sides now once you have this equation what you just want is where to go maximum and minimum distances so basically the maximum and minimum values of x and then that thing plus l naught well, that should do it fine so just figure out what this would be so um, yeah d squared x upon dt squared is equal to negative actually it should be like f upon uh, so f into 1 upon m2 plus 1 upon m1 uh, minus kx just, yeah well oh it should not be like that sorry sorry, sorry. It's going to be f upon m2 minus kx times 1 upon m1 plus 1 upon m2. So now we know what the spring force is. Oh, sorry, uh, what the sort x over here, right? So now you know uh, what the time period is and what the frequencies of this oscillation. Anyway, so this will be the equilibrium condition where d squared x one d d squared is zero, right? So what we'll just say is at x naught this this side becomes uh, zero so then you can just write this so uh, just figure out what x naught is x naught will be oh this is getting so so weird uh f upon m2 upon all that stuff okay oh come on upon k times of one upon m2 plus one upon m1 let's just, i don't know define m2 plus m1 so m2 upon m1 to be something and then use that Maybe, maybe that's good to do. You could, right? Uh, the second question is, so first you just have this V equal and then equal to M1, M2, force equal to one of, uh, mass M2. So you will have to do this in the general case. Uh, right, so just to skip some notation, I will say M2 upon M1 is eta. And yes, this is in fact eta, it's not new. <laughs> I just search up the Greek, uh, Greek alphabet and it is, it is eta. So this will be like f upon so k times of one plus m to one m one is going to be one plus eta. Yes, that's what x naught will be. Okay, and then this whole thing uh, you can basically write this as uh, well. Yeah, so m two is just eta times m one. That's why I write this as one upon m one, and you got f upon or I mean. Okay, x is all of that stuff, I understand that, right, so f upon m2, which is like f upon eta times, um, eta times m1, right, that will just be equal to x naught k 1 plus eta upon uh, eta m1, and putting that in here, just get, and this is also pretty much the same thing, but with x instead of x naught, so yeah. It will just be negative k eta. No, it's not eta. It's one plus eta. Then upon eta uh, times m one, and then that times of x minus x naught, right? That's how it's gonna be. So yeah, and then you can just write this as d squared x minus x naught upon dt squared. So first of all, at the very start, what is happening? Non-deformed state. So it's the farthest away that is it's gonna start off. So like this thing, uh, oh yeah, we don't know the Actually we don't know what the amplitude is. This thing is the amplitude itself, huh? Yeah. So you just have x is equal to x naught plus uh, whatever the amplitude is, which is also x naught, huh? x naught. And that type of sign, 
So square root of all that stuff, square root of k into 1 plus eta upon eta m1 and uh, that times t, right? So at t is equal to 0, it will be x0, we don't want that, we want this to be negative 1 so that x becomes 0. Uh, so we'll just put minus pi upon 2 and this should do it. And if I just put, you know, like negative cosine and stuff. All right. So now the question is, uh, you want to find the maximum and minimum distance between the bars, right? So just put this, whatever this thing is, omega t, right? Just put that as, um, so for the maximum distance, just put that as uh, negative 1. So just get 2x naught as the maximum distance. And for the minimum distance, just put that as um, um, positive 1, right? So you'll get 0. Hmm. That's weird. Wait, what? Is that for real? Oh, it really is x naught, and then oh, it's gonna go all the way to x naught. What? No, how can that be? You got what the equilibrium position is, and then of course it just must be at. Oh yeah, it really is like that, huh? It's at one of the extremes, and then this is the this is the. Uh. Yeah. Wow. And what was x naught? It was with the elong elong elongation, right? So uh, it's at the, I mean, this whole thing is at the most compressed state right now, which is weird because it cannot be more compressed. Is that real? But it is just like that. So fine, this thing L0 was in fact the minimum distance. And then L0 plus 2x0 will be the maximum distance. We figure out what x0 is and then we are basically done. Yes. Okay, okay, this is fantastic. I mean, I get the idea how it's happening. Okay, okay, just deal with it. It's maths. That's what it's saying us. So there we go. Minimum is uh, a lot, and maximum is a lot plus two times of x naught, which is just two f upon k times of one plus mu, right? Uh, Yes, yes, that's, that should make sense. So there we go. This is it. Answer. Done. Now, that's A. Oh, no, that's not A. That's actually equal to B. So this is B. Oh, and just uh, put back what this should be. So we'll say it's going to be M1 plus M2, and then you got M, M1 on the top. Yes. Okay, so B is done. Let's go to A. Uh, a is when this will be equal. So it's got minimum as L naught, maximum as. So when this will be equal, it will become 2 and yeah, 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 whatever. It's going to be F1k. So it's just L naught plus F1k. There we go. Uh, 153. Okay. A system consists of two identical cubes, each of mass M, linked together by the compressed weightless spring of stiffness uh, X. Stiffness K. I'll use K. The cubes are also connected by a thread which is burnt through this through what figure 1.41 this right connected by a thread which is burnt through at a certain moment. Uh, okay. Compressed weightless spring. Hmm. It didn't give us the compression though. Delta L, what is delta L? You didn't give us anything. Oh, the initial, they uh, did give us. The initial compression of the spring. Fine, fine, fine. The lower cube will bounce up after the thread has been uh, burned through. Right. Okay, okay. Now I understand what's happening. So you just need to figure out what the normal force uh, by the ground on the lower cube is, right? That should do it. So if the lower cube never uh, goes away, so it never bounces off, then what's the condition? Yes. Okay, and the B is toward height H, the center of gravity of the system will rise if the initial compression of the spring is sound and dial, whatever. Yeah. Wow. It's not really fun. <laughs> Fine. So, if it initially had delta L compression, yes. So, your X initial was just, let's just say negative delta L because compression will be negative X uh, and then elongation will be positive. Yes. 
first. Uh, the force put on M by the spring will be so Kx in, in the upward direction. Yes. Uh, the force put on this this mass will be negative kx and then there will be other force as well which is just the gravity so because of that the acceleration of this thing will uh, be just negative g minus negative kx upon m yes that's right so it's just equal to and yeah i mean like this guy's height is so uh, the, the second derivative of that height is just the same thing as the second derivative of x so this is just t squared x upon t squared so once again the same kind of thing it's at the uh extreme position the because we can figure we can figure out everything yes once you figure out what the equivalent position is and how much far away it is the same thing going up and then that um extension gives the maximum upward force on m and then if that somehow becomes more than the normal force uh sorry if it somehow becomes more than the gravity force we are done it will bounce up Yes. Ooh, it's gonna be long. Fine. So, in fact, we can even figure out at what extension will it bounce up. So, your x naught, that is your uh, equilibrium position, is just going to be. Ooh. Yeah. Well, you need it to be compressed, huh? Okay. Fine. Negative mg upon k. Yes. Uh, and initially it's at negative delta L. So uh, this minus that, that would be mg upon k minus delta L. Uh, yeah. But in fact, let's not do it. Let's uh, instead go with. And that would be the. Yeah, you should do that. The initial value minus this value, that is how much behind it is. Now we want to make that forward. So this will be x naught plus. Um, basically, x i minus x naught. Oh, sorry, no, 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 negative, negative of that whole thing. This is what we are looking for, which is just going to be two x naught minus x i. So yeah, that will be the biggest extension of this guy. Ah, okay, this is the. And what the x uh, escape? That is when it will start jumping up. Uh, that will happen when when kx is equal to um, the other guy. So it's just going to be, let's just use this as capital M, right? So the lower block will be capital M times G. So x escape will be mg upon k. It's a positive quantity, huh? Okay, so I can get rid of all of that. Yes. So you have it x max is 2x minus xi, which is just 2 times of negative delta L. No, okay, x1 is this thing. So we need 2 uh, negative 2mg upon k and then minus xi, so it's going to be plus delta L. Okay, cool. Then x minimum is just negative delta L. Then x escape is mg upon k. And x equilibrium, so x naught. I don't know, equilibrium should have E, but whatever, I'm just going to use X naught. It's negative mg upon K. Alright, once we have all of this information, we can now deal with the question. Okay, so A part is at what value of delta L, the initial compression of the spring, uh, the lower block, the lower cube will bounce up after the thread has been burned through. Okay. So it's uh, its maximum should be more than the escape, right? That's what it's really saying. And then capital M is also equal to small m. So really just delta L should be bigger than 3mg upon k, whenever that happens. Right, and then look at this guy, 7mg upon k, it's so much bigger, right? So it will just go up, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh -huh -huh. So you can actually figure out uh, that uh, at the escape, right? What the velo what will be the velocity of this whole system upwards? So, well, A is uh, just done. You know, A was easy. So, delta L critical is just three mg upon uh, k. 
Well, you know what? Just do it the general way. So not dealing with uh, whatever. Just do it like this. Okay, let's do P now. To what height as the center of gravity of this system will rise if the initial compression of this spring uh, is well delta L is equal to 7 mg upon x. So it goes from 7 mg upon x all the way. So negative 7 mg upon x. Uh, so the energy stored would just be half kx squared. You get the idea. And then it goes to uh, the escape velocity which is like mg upon k so you have a decrease in the energy of the spring so increase the energy of the whole system and you know this lower block won't be moving up till that point just the upper block is having an upward velocity because i mean it has to escape it, it cannot be going down anyway. and then of course of course i mean this uh, is actually about the about uh the equilibrium position so it's got to go up yeah so what's the difference but half k x squared uh so initially just 7 mg upon k so we're gonna do 7 mg, mg upon k squared anything so it'll be m squared g squared upon k squared and then it's going to be 7 squared minus 1 so 49 oh, sorry 48 because minus 1 24 m squared g squared upon k squared right uh that will be in fact the kinetic energy of this whole system yes and okay so we just want at what height edge the center of gravity of the spring will rise uh that's um it's weird well there is some extension and both of these are in fact collapsing together and oh you just want the center of mass is velocity no big deal we can do it okay so now uh this times of m1 which is m right and that yeah well this is just energy you don't want the energy you want to know what the velocity is it's supposed to be equal to half mv squared yeah that should do it so this cancels hmm, this is weird what is this hmm yeah, whatever fine and it's not supposed to be k squared it's supposed to be k only so really just v is square root of 48 mg squared and that thing upon k right yeah that's the initial launching velocity of this guy then we will go up to what height it's got well v square minus u oh wait it's not the velocity of the center of mass it's uh of just this guy so that thing upon 2 is what we're looking for so the velocity of center of mass initial from the uc whatever that will be square root of 6 upon 4 so 12 12 mg squared upon k and then what we want is just uh, v square minus u squared is equal to do this. So basically half u squared is equal to gh. Yes. Uh, it's going to be 6m g squared upon k is equal to g times h. Yes, that, that's what we're looking for. So h would just be 6mg upon k it seems. Oh wow, that is very weird. Right. That's what it is. Okay. Fine. Let's go with it. So you got 6 mg upon k as the value. Okay, cool. Now we can get rid of all of this. And in fact, let's not get rid of all of that. This might be useful. Okay, cool. Let's go to 154. Oh, and I just draw a figure as well because you don't know what M is or what yeah, capital M is small M is. Ah, whatever. They will figure out what X is anyway. I will figure out what X is in the future when I will see this. Okay, 154. Two identical buggies. Buggies. Whatever. One and two with one mass in each move without friction due to inertia along the parallel rails uh, toward each other. You don't have figure for this? Oh, come on. So two identical 
uh, against one and two with one man. One man, sorry, I thought it was mass. Uh, man in each move without friction due to inertia along the parallel rails. Uh, along, okay, towards each other. When the buggies get opposite, uh, got, okay, okay, okay. The man exchange their places by jumping in direction perpendicular to the motion direction. Wait, what? But that will, huh. As a cons consequence, buggy one stops and buggy two keeps moving uh, in the same direction with its uh, with its velocity. So there's no friction. I mean, on the whole system. So buggy one plus man one plus buggy two plus man two. That whole system has no friction acting on it. Ooh, that's that's perfect. Okay. Consequence: buggy one stops and buggy two uh, keeps moving in the same direction with its velocity becoming equal to v. Ooh. And then it's like perpendicular or whatever. Hmm. But if these are perpendicular and and these are on rail tracks, so there is also this force. So there's force in the in the uh, direction perpendicular to rail tracks, yes, and everything, yes. But there's no force in the direction parallel to the rail tracks. So uh, in that direction, we can apply conservation of momentum. Buggy one stops and buggy two uh, keeps moving in the same direction. Its velocity becoming equal to v. Initially, we don't know what the velocities are, right? Uh, so just along the uh, parallel rays towards each other. Okay, okay, that's different. Finding each other. Oh, so that's what we have to find. If the man the what if the mass of each buggy without a man equals capital M and the mass of each man is small m. Ah right, it's actually doable. No big deal. Man has changed the places jumping in the direction perpendicular to the velocities. Whatever, just just do it. So one of the buggy stops and the other one keeps on moving. Okay. So initially if if these are like v1 v2 in like opposite directions right okay so you got this is moving with v1 you got a mass m over here you got mass m of the buggy this is of mass m as well you got this guy with mass m but then this is moving with v2 in this direction and then finally one of these stops so buggy one stops right so now this thing is at zero this uh this contains mass m and capital m and this thing uh, moves with velocity v, and uh, yeah, in what direction though? Oh, the thing is, while it's while these men are jumping, uh, the oh, like okay, no, the buggies could get different forces, and that would mm -hmm, that would won't that would just not work. Uh, do we have to do that analysis every time? I don't think that's correct to do. But then it stops. Hmm. Sure, you can write an equation for this. But one equation won't be. We'll need two of these. Fine. So we'll have to do it step by step. Ah, uh, this is not good. Do we can have, we can definitely find a relation? Yes. In the same direction they are saying, so buggy 2 keeps moving in the same direction. Plus TV, still got this mass M, capital M over here. Okay. Find the initial velocity of the buggies. Uh, okay. Think about it, think about it. So, uh, we'll just disassemble everything into... So, something like this, right? So, you got this man over here, you got some... So this man over here, and you got this... Uh, these two buggies like that. This is moving with v1 in that direction. It's moving with v1 in that direction. So the momentum is m1 v1 in that, and capital M1. Sorry, capital M and v1. Yes. Now, when this guy will jump, it will impart some momentum on this guy. So we we'll have some uh, p1 maybe, and then it will have some p2 like that. And this is moving with v2, and this is moving with uh, v2 as well, right? And then when it will jump, it will also impart some momentum on this thing. So let's just go with P1 in this direction. And yeah, 
Now what will happen? Uh, the thing is, this guy with P1 over here, and he got initially it's also just M MV2. So that whole momentum thing, it will go on to this guy, right? So you have to write two equations and two variables. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. MV1. Oof. Okay, okay, think about it. Oh, it's supposed to be P1 in that direction, sorry. Sorry, P2 in this case, right? Because it's going to be P1, right? This is P2, P2. Yes. Or you could go the, the other way around because that's like more intuitive, I guess. So you got P2 like this and then P2 like that. So the arrows matter. Okay, so let's talk about the momentum. So, yeah, this plus that, that's the momentum that we're talking about. It's got M1, V1, so MV1, minus P1, and then you got minus P2, and minus MV2. That should be equal to zero. And let's talk about this and this. So you got P2 minus M, so small m, small m. Oh, and this should also be... This should be small m as well because this is the buggy. Wait, but the masses of men's are small m. So the buggy has capital M mass, right? So it should be small m right here. We got capital M right here. Oh, then this equation is slightly different, but the same thing in the end. So you got mv1 is equal to p1, and then you got uh, this guy has got p2. Uh, plus small mv2 and then for this you just have small mv1 plus capital M so just not actually capital p2 okay is equal to p1 oh so p1 is also there so uh, everything that's upwards got p1 over there and then you got wait what uh huh this is just not good uh oh. oh no actually it's uh, it's different sorry sorry uh we should be talking about like that okay this is got p2 right there this is a uh, p1 upwards you also got mv1 uh, upwards you just got this thing minus mv2 downwards and this is equal to so it's the same it's not the same equation it's, it's different okay but the problem is you got p2 plus p1 over here mm -hmm. that's not doable Right, okay. Oof. We can definitely find a relation, yes, but uh, like this stops and everything, I understand that. But then, if it's not, I mean, if just have this P1, P2 everywhere, you won't be able to figure out anything. Because, right, it's just not doable like that. You know, whatever you will, you will uh, like, you will find P1 from one equation, substitute it back into the other. So, suppose it's complete this equation. So, this will be just minus MV. Yes, good, no problem. The thing is, ah, this is so not good. Moreover, there's going to be like a uh, friction between the clothes and the buggies and whatever. So, that energy conservation is just something we cannot do directly. Heat dissipation, everything, right? What do we do now? You can only figure out what's uh, what V is, not what V1. Yeah, but like what V1, V2, uh, both would be. That is, we just cannot do that. Even with this, uh, you cannot do it. Oh, this is not good. One thing. Oh, it's gonna be M plus M, but yeah, it's still the same thing. What do we do now? Perpendicular, huh? Wait, oh, oh, I. Ah. Why didn't I think of it? Am I that dumb? 
Okay. So what question was this once again? Yes. When the buggies get opposite each other, man exchange their places by jumping in a direction perpendicular to the motion direction. Right. Of course. They have no par they have no component parallel to the rails. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That means the, the buggies have the uh, have all of the component of the thing. Right, 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 right. But uh, wait, do they think that they are jumping parallel or uh, perpendicular or do they actually jump perpendicular? Because then when they when they will jump perpendicular, they will leave all their parallel velocity completely, right? Hmm. Yeah. Hmm, this is not doing it. I mean, even if this guy left, he would still have some velocity over here. And this is coming in with zero velocity, and that would be in the end, it would just have some velocity. And oh, yeah, and this is not making any sense. Oh, they think they think they are going perpendicular, but what it really is happening is that. Uh, we can see them not going perpendicular exactly. They are having V2 as, I mean, this guy, this small m will have V2 as well as it will have some perpendicular velocity. I think that's what's happening. Oh, uh, then these impart no momentum on each other. And that's a very strong condition. It just gives away the answer completely. But can we assume that? If we have to solve it, we have to assume. There's no other way. You just don't have those many equations. Okay. So if that's happening, you can get rid of this P1, P2. It's just not here anymore. Yeah, perfect. And then just do momentum conservation on, on uh, this and this combined. Oh, it's not it's not P1, P2 anymore. So it's just like this has a V2 and this has V2 right there. And let's do momentum conservation on this and that. It will just be uh, MV2 minus MV1 is equal to capital M plus small m V. And then momentum of this one gives us that mv1 is equal to mv2 you got the equations cool and now you can figure out what v1 and v2 should be right so uh let's let's cancel out v2 from here so v2 will just be capital m upon small m v1 it's going to be capital m squared upon small m let's say that capital m upon small m is a uh, mu sorry eta yeah that's what we use eta so this will be like um, that v2 is just eta v1 and then this whole equation just becomes eta v2 minus v1 is equal to eta plus 1 times v. So then putting this here just get eta square minus 1 which is like eta plus 1 times eta minus 1. So in the end just get v1 is equal to uh, v upon eta minus 1. So v2 will be eta times uh, v upon eta minus 1. There we go. You found out the thing. So v1 is just what was this? Uh, v upon eta minus one, just like v upon capital M minus small m, and then got small m over here. And v2 was a uh, just eta times this thing, right? So capital M upon small m times all of this. So this would just be capital M uh, v upon capital M minus small m, right? That's how it should be. That's how it should be. Next. This was 154, let's go to 155 now. But this is based off on assumptions and how would, I mean, it can, it's not solvable directly, right? Or is there something that I'm just missing in this question? I don't know. 155, two identical, wow, wow okay. Same kind of question. Move uh, one after another due to inertia. Uh, with the same velocity v not a man of mass m jump okay mass m rides the rear buggy at a certain moment the man jumps in the front buggy with velocity u relative to this buggy knowing that the mass of each man is equal to uh, capital m rides the rear buggy uh, mass of each buggy is capital m 
uh, find the velocity with which the buggies will move after that. Uh, right. So this guy is now moving relative uh, with this velocity uh, u, right? <laughs> Oof. Okay, cool. So now, uh, whatever this buggy is. So first of all, a rear buggy is like this. Oh, and uh, these two buggies are attached or something? No, it's moving one, one after another. That's all it's doing, right? Yeah, they're not attached or anything. Okay, into the front buggy with velocity something. Where the mass of each buggy is this thing? Find a velocity with which buggies will move after that. Assuming they are not attached, I guess. The thing is M. You got this small M, uh, small M guy over here. This is moving with velocity what? Uh, v naught. Then uh, it has relative velocity u, right? It jumps out with that. Oh, it's a vector. Uh, but V naught is not equal as a vector. We're just assuming it's vectors okay then this has a relative velocity uh, u so after this happens after it jumps let's say this has velocity v and now this of course so got capital m over here and then this guy must have velocity as v vector plus u vector but then of course momentum conservation tells us that mv vector plus mu vector is it up and then plus capital m v vector is equal to small m v naught vector and then this guy jumps on the other buggy which was going with i mean uh v naught right so the other buggy was like this and now the momentum of these of the complete system will just be so for uh, this plus that combined it will just be m v naught plus oh, it should be vectors plus m v vector plus m u vector is equal to uh capital m plus small m times uh, in fact, I'll just say it's like V1 or something, or, um, yeah, I just want this to be like that, or V1. Yes, this will be like V1 right there. Okay, and I will say it's like V2 vector. Cool. Cool. Fine. We got these two equations, let's solve these. And of course, as always, uh, we just say, Let's in fact go the other way around. Let's say small m upon capital M is uh, in time in this case. So then this is this just becomes v naught vector plus uh, eta v one vector plus eta u vector is equal to one plus eta v two vector, and then you just have. In fact, maybe you should not do it. Just go the other way around. Capital M upon small m is equal to eta. So you don't need this. Instead, this will be like eta v naught vector plus v one vector plus uh, u vector is equal to eta plus one times uh, v two vector, and then this just becomes v one vector plus u vector uh, plus um, eta v one vector is equal to uh, v naught vector. Yes, we want to figure out what v one and uh, v two is, so we need that equation. In fact, since you will always have this uh, u over here, so I'll just uh, I mean think of it as one sep one single entity. Uh, no, okay, you do have this uh, without it as well. So you got this over here, right? Okay, then let's form some equations. Ah, okay, I need to figure out this. this is going to be long. V a plus one v two vector minus v one vector is equal to eta v naught vector plus u vector this equation just tells us that well, this is also just one so eta plus one p one vector and then minus well there's nothing over there oh wow okay this is nice it just gives away what v one should be so v naught plus u vector Ooh, yes that makes perfect sense right it should so just v one vector is equal to v naught vector minus u vector upon eta plus one now putting that in here let's see what we get so we just get well v2 vector times eta plus 1 is equal to v1 vector which is this thing so like v naught vector minus u vector upon eta plus 1 and then this plus eta v naught vector plus u vector i guess so that will be like ooh. 
uh, eta squared plus eta times v naught vector and then you got this plus uh, v naught vector once again so this plus one uh, v naught vector and then you got eta plus one and that minus one so it's just plus eta times u vector upon eta plus one there so v2 it's not supposed to be squared sorry v2 vector is just eta squared plus why is this weird quick weird kind of expression over here it's not natural anyhow but that's what this is giving us is this correct it must be that's what these equations are telling us yeah I make some kind of mistake no we don't have time for things of that if it is it is Oof. Okay, plus eta uh, u vector upon eta plus 1 squared. Right, so these are our equations. Finally, we got the answer now. Oh, uh, we will need to leave that. This cancels. Okay, let's write down these equations. Just wait a second. So our first equation, this is our second equation, and of course we just have uh, eta is equal to capital M upon small n. All right, 156. Okay, 156 is uh, two men, each of mass M, stand on the edge of a stationary buggy of mass capital. Wait, uh, 156. Uh, we Right, okay, it's uh, one second, similar question. Edge of a stationary buggy of mass capital M. Uh, assuming the friction to be negligible, find the velocity of the buggy after both men jump off with the same horizontal velocity u. Related to the buggy. Okay, simultaneously one after another. Okay. <laughs> so simultaneously it will, it will be different and then one after another it will be oh yeah in what case will the velocity of the buggy be greater in in, uh, in how many times okay fine 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 let's just do it so for the first case we just have like what two men uh the same velocity just jump out it's as if you had a mass of 2m you throw, threw it away right so this will be like m and whatever final velocity it gains plus 2m times that final velocity plus u vector and that's going to be equal to uh it's a stationary buggy okay it's going to be zero so you can figure out what the velocity should be from this so v vector is just equal to negative 2m u vector uh, upon capital m plus 2m right so that's that's first so first case this is happening and what if they jump one after another so first uh, this guy jumps then it, it just becomes well instead of having 2m just have m so minus m u vector upon capital m plus small m right yes now uh yeah i mean this would be the velocity after the first guy jumps off right Oh, and in fact, like capital M is uh, just, uh, it's not supposed to be capital M, it's supposed to be capital M plus small m, right? Yeah, so capital M plus uh, 2m in that case. I guess that makes sense. Okay, think about it. Think about it. Does it make sense? I guess it should. This is like capital, uh, this is uh, just equal to v vector, right? It's saying that capital M v vector, so capital M plus M v vector plus small m v vector plus small m u vector. Uh, yeah, right, it's it's correct. Now, once you have this, let's just uh, write this u1 vector because, yes. So now once you have this velocity, you can write the equation, once it's going to be capital uh, M v vector, finally. So it's the final velocity. And then uh, plus, it's going to be small m times v vector plus u vector is equal to so whatever this guy's momentum was. 
So that would just be capital M plus small m times all of this. So then we go capital M plus small m upon capital M plus 2m. This is the velocity gained by what? Uh, yeah, by the whole system after the first guy jumps out. Let's just follow the second guy jumping out. Okay, negative m u vector. That should do it. Now we need to figure out what v vector is from here. Mm -hmm. So capital M plus you just divide by capital M upon uh, plus small m anyway. So it will just be v vector plus small m upon capital M plus small m times u vector is equal to uh, negative small m upon capital M plus 2m u vector, right? So v vector is just equal to uh, small m upon, we'll just take small m common. Uh, yeah, it's going to be 1 upon capital M plus small m plus 1 upon capital M plus 2m. That times m u vector, the negative of that, of course. So this is the thing. Yes, that should do it. Or do we need to actually figure out the expression for this thing? Uh, fine. So what do we do? Uh, we'll just say capital M upon small m is eta, just as always, and then figure this out. So first case, just have velocity vector is equal to negative 2u vector upon eta plus 2. Now in the second case, you just have velocity vector is equal to, ooh, it's gonna be tough. So you got, this m uh, comes inside, just get eta plus 1, and then you got 1 upon eta plus 2, huh? Negative and of course uh, u vector. Huh. This will be like negative uh, eta plus so two eta plus uh, three upon eta square plus three eta plus two. Huh. This is weird. Once again, a weird quadratic. Why did I get that? Okay, fine. So just that's the equation. Uh, it's gonna be negative two eta plus three upon eta squared plus 3 eta plus 2 and which is basically like eta plus 2 times eta plus 1 so uh, yeah let's write it like that that's better now the ratio uh yeah so the ratio will just be okay so got v vector 2 is top magnitude or whatever v vector one that will just be this upon that anyway and magnitude wise mm -hmm. this thing is just got like uh, two eta plus three upon two times of eta plus one right so more like two eta plus two that times whatever is there so we can write it like that that v two vector Is equal to this stuff times uh, the one vector. There we go. Got the answer now. And then of course eta is just capital M upon small m. One fifty seven. A chain hangs on a thread and touches the surface of a table by its lower end, so that after the thread has been bur burned through. What? Chain hangs on a thread. Thread. Chain. Okay. Touches the surface of the table. So this is the whole chain thing. The, touches the surface of the table. Show that after the thread has been burned through the force exerted on the table by the falling part of the chain at any moment is twice as great as the force of pressure exerted by the part already resting on the table. Oh. Uh. So uh, this surface, is this like friction, does this have friction or what? Okay, we don't know. Uh, oh, this is very weird. Force analysis directly won't work, right? We don't know what this velocity is at any given moment, do we? So let's just assume that whatever part hits the table, it will instantly come to rest somehow. I mean, somehow. We don't know how it will happen. So it is going to happen, happen through normal force, of course. Oh, yeah, I mean, it will, uh, the in the y direction, it will come to rest, right? It has to come to rest. So there we go.
even if it, the expansion it is not going to rest, right? So there's like energy conservation of whatever uh, in the y direction, it must come to rest, right? So at any given moment, so you got this like a bunch of chain up over here, and then it, it, this is like like that, whatever. And uh, does the chain sag or something? So uh, I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> uh, we don't know if the chain sags or not. Let's just assume it doesn't, right? Even if it tries to. Uh, okay, you know what? Let's take the case of the chain falling down under a constraint, right? And then we'll see if it actually uh, is supposed to sag or not. If it if we remove this uh, tube that this chain is falling down in, so this tube can only exert horizontal forces, no vertical forces allowed. Okay, if this chain is going down with velocity v and it's not sagging or anything, right? And then you got a bunch of mass over here or whatever. If this uh, is uh, length x and the whole length was, I don't know, l, so then x upon l uh, times the mass. This is what the mass of this whole guy is, yes? Uh, okay, that's not important. What we want is the m dot thing. Right. What's the force on this chain? Like on this piece of chain? Huh. The thing is it contains dm upon dt, so it's not the best candidate to do this. Oof. To actually figure out how the velocity changes, you would need something like that. Uh. This is gonna get complicated like that. Okay, let's just think about the whole chain then. This whole chain, uh, what's the t, uh, I mean, what's the change in momentum of this guy? Well, in every time dt, uh, you have a v dt of element, so that much of, uh, L, that much of length hitting this ground and coming to rest, so that much mass loses velocity v. Right, so you have you are imparting that momentum, so it's upward, right? And uh, yeah, okay, so that's upward. And how much is it? It is the velocity v, so the magnitude of it, uh, yes, that times dm upon dt, which is so dm is just going to be v dt, and that thing upon dt, that's just the length, of, all right? That's just the length, uh, yeah, I mean, v dt is just the length. Uh, what you want, want is this type of linear density, which is just like uh, m upon l, and that whole thing upon our uh, dt, and that's why this cancels away. So just m v squared upon l, that is the uh, yeah, that's that's one thing. So right, that's the momentum because of the uh, mass changing. But then you also have the other guy. Actually, no, you know what? Oh yeah, uh, that should be the case. Sorry, and then you got this uh, mass on this, which has uh, what what mass is this? This is going to be x times of m upon l. That is moving in velocity v. So uh, whatever the acceleration is upward, that will be it. Yeah, that will be involved in the force as well. So this is the total force as experienced by the change. So that's the normal force that we are looking for. But then how do we figure out what this acceleration really is? That's complicated. Hmm. Ah, what do we do? Hey, you know what? I'm thinking something. I'm thinking of something. Uh, what if we did this same analysis, but instead of having this ground as the ending point. We cut this uh, slice open, so uh, this made an imaginary surface through which, right, so this whole thing is what we'll consider as our system. Does that make sense? I guess it should. So so then the force uh, experienced by this whole system, that will just be the tension force. Yeah, I mean, either the tension force or whatever the normal force is being put up because it's getting compressed or something. Well, mv squared upon l, well, that is supposed to be upwards because it's losing velocity in this particular direction. So it's going to be upward. 
Yeah. So, thing is, this guy should be uh, should feel an upward force, but then tension can only have a downward force, and that makes no sense. How to? Oh, uh, yeah. That's also this guy. So this is actually downwards. Sorry, it should be downwards. So then, uh, yeah, it's gonna be negative or something. So what forces are on this guy? Tension force, which will assume to be downwards. So we, I just want to prove that it's gonna be downward. You got negative tension force, and then also the gravity. So it's gonna be negative x m upon l. Uh, the times of g. Yes, that should do it. And then a is just dv upon dt. So you got an equation in. Well, not exactly. You still have this tension that you don't know how to deal with. Ah. Uh, oh, you could integrate with x because throughout uh, this part, right? So throughout this thing, uh, yeah, well, it's gonna be constant and everything. Oh, and by the way, the tension over here must be zero because it's it's like a really small amount of mass. If there was any big tension, uh, it wouldn't work, right? Yes. So over here, the tension is almost zero. Over here, we don't know what the tension is. Okay. Oh, so that that will be like for a finite block. So we would need to integrate this thing. Oh, it's getting complicated. <sighs> Come on, think. We need to figure out an acceleration. That's the, that's the only chance at doing it. Ah, but then this tension is just a new variable, and we don't know how to deal with it. Oh, come on! So it's twice as great as the force of pressure. So there's one thing I could do, and well, assume that the tension is zero for each element, or something like that. It's not gonna help. It's not gonna help, right? No, no, no. That's that's not gonna help. Tension is a time, yes. And uh, well, yeah, that, that's all you can say. Nothing else. What can you do? That's for the analysis of this particular guy. Oh, hey, hey, we also can just uh, do the analysis of this block. So not uh, this whole system, but just this block and uh, not defining uh, a system in fact in the first place. Then we just, just take this little part and then you, even if, it, if it's moving, right, just do the analysis on this guy. So what's the force that this uh, has to experience? Just the gravity force and the tension. Once again, the same thing, right? So this quantity, yeah, and uh, it's moving down. So really, it just becomes well, this guy actually uh, is giving two different results. How can that be? Uh huh. Uh oh. Yeah, I mean, it's giving us two different results, but that shouldn't make sense. Tension force. Oh, well, something's wrong, right? That momentum is changing, of course. Did I mess up something? Because it seems to be something that's not dependent on this particular case, but then for any body, you could just have this block uh, figure out whatever force are on this guy. So if there's F over here, this guy's mass M or whatever. It has edge length A, I don't know. So uh, yeah, your acceleration called edge length L. So your acceleration for this guy will just be F upon M and whatever. So your equation would really just be F is equal to M A. But then if somehow um, uh, you cut open this, right? So you define all of this part to be a system, yes. Um, oh God. Yeah, I see what's happening. I see what's happening. The force this will feel. Oh, this is weird. Uh, in fact, let's not go with that. Let's uh, let's just say that this part, this this uh, M part, 
was a part of a bigger block, right? And uh, the immediate force on this is just F. And let's define this as a system. So this thing, right? Now instantaneously the force on this is just F. And uh, this should be equal to the change in momentum, right? Uh, yeah. So once again, it should be V D M upon D T, which is uh, just oh god, V D M upon D T is going to be V times of if this thing is let's say X, uh, then it's going to be oh, let's just not do it. If this is going with velocity V, right? Then the force will just be V times of so dm upon dt will be v uh, dt that upon dt anyway and then you just want uh, the linear density which is going to be m upon l yes that that should do it okay that's because of the mass change so v dm upon dt but you also need m db upon dt so for that you would need whatever mass this guy has and then uh, it should yeah i mean okay m upon l works perfectly and then dv upon dt is really just acceleration so then that would mean this has to be zero but how can that be because that would mean v square is zero which is making no sense it cannot be right uh, i mean in, in generally it cannot be zero it will be non-zero at points so there's definitely something i'm missing right here yeah uh, the assumption that the force acting on this whole system is f Maybe that is wrong. Maybe that's not the force because, hmm. Could it be that that's not the force? Right? So there's some other force that's acting over here as well. Uh, which force? I don't know. For the whole block, the force will be F, yes. But for just this this uh, amount of blocks, so the, the thing on the left of this this imaginary surface. Yeah, so that force is not F most likely and you cannot do it just like that. Okay, okay. You know what? It's time to stop. Guess I'll see you guys in the next video and figure out how this is working. So bye. See you guys in the next video.